Welcome back to Think Tech. This is movies we can learn from. Today is a lot to learn. The movie is Platoon, uh, uh, produced by, directed by Oliver Stone, 1968. And the question before the house is, what can it tell us about American involvement and atrocities in Vietnam? So hmm, make sure you're sitting down for this one. It's a shockeroo. And it's, it's really hard to watch, as a matter of fact. For this discussion, we have Jacqueline Ferro, uh, Michael Lilly, um, both retired Navy and Marine Corps for Shackley. And uh, we're going to talk about this movie. Shackley, can you give us an overview of what this movie was about, where it comes from, what it does? Yes. Um, hi, Jay. I'm happy to do that. And then um, I'll chime in as we go along. It's a, it's a, there's a lot to it. And I'll say uh, up front, um, I think it's the very best combat uh, movie uh, that I've seen. Uh, and it ranks right up there with All Quiet on the Western Front and Das Boat and perhaps a couple of others. Um, it was uh, maybe the third Vietnam movie that came out. I remember right during the Vietnam War, there was a period where there weren't any movies about it. And then I think Deer Hunter was the first. And, which was very popular, and then Apocalypse Now came out, and then later Platoon came out. But as you mentioned, uh, Oliver Stone is the is the person who wrote the the story. Uh, it was about his personal experience as a foot soldier, infantryman, uh, in Vietnam, and uh, and he he uh, took him quite a while to get someone. In the, I guess initially uh, there was not. The, the uh, producers didn't want to produce a movie about Vietnam like, for political reasons or whatever. So he had trouble getting sponsorship, but he finally did, and he directed it. And so he had had total control over it. And he did a couple of really interesting things, which I'll describe to make it as realistic as possible. Uh, it was it came out in 1986, but it um, it is the story of his basically his story. Uh, of his time in Vietnam as a foot soldier with the 21st, 25th Infantry Division, which interestingly was created and is based still today at Schofield Barracks in Hawaii. Yeah, it's known, uh, has a, uh, one of the slogans is that it's called the Tropical Lightning Division. And if you, if you see in the movie, they have these patches on their shoulders that have a lightning bolt, that's Tropical Lightning. Uh, that division was in Vietnam for quite a while, most of the war, uh, and then people would be rotated in and out. Uh, but just just briefly, uh, it was created in 1941, fought in the Battle of Guadalcanal and in the Philippines, which was vicious fighting. It was also an occupational force in Viet in uh, Japan. Uh, it fought in Korea at the Pusan perim perimeter and other areas. It was in Vietnam from 65 to 71. And fought in uh, a lot of the major battles. The 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 what's pre, uh, portrayed in the movie is its activities up near the Cambodian border. There were some battles up there that actually occurred, and that uh, Oliver Stone participated in. It also served in Iraq and Afghanistan. Now, uh, Stone was was a, a member of the second platoon of Bravo Company of the third battalion of the twenty fifth Infantry Division. Now. For, for those who are not familiar with, with what these organizations are, a platoon uh, in, in the infantry is made up of about 30 or 40 people, soldiers, and it's the, it's the smallest unit usually uh, commanded by a lieutenant. Uh, you have a lieutenant, and then you have a platoon sergeant who's, who's like the guy who actually gets things done. Senior, the senior NCOs in the military are the people who actually know how to do things and get things done. The officers are, are more uh, like administrators or their staff officers like JAG and medical and so on. Uh, 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 Mike was a line officer. That's a real sailor. <laughs> I was a JAG, which is a, a staff officer. It's not, there's all these rules about who can command. And if you're in a lifeboat, you know, it's always a line officer, even if he's a junior, uh, junior rank. Not, it's not a, not a, uh, Jack. Anyway, let, let me say, Shackley, they could have used the Jack officer in platoon. <laughs> they could have used him in the field. It would have helped. Well, you know, they started. They started doing that 
In Vietnam, I had friends who were at, at all of the operational headquarters, and what they did is they provided input on the on the rules of engagement and and uh, operations and uh, and things like that. And maybe that's the le one of the lessons from Vietnam. Actually, it's interesting. Anyway, this is the story of his tour of duty. And in those days, um, a tour of duty was a year. Uh, and 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 what. what Maybe a lot of the viewers won't know uh, who didn't serve in the militaries. Back in those days, you got drafted. If you were able-bodied, you you knew that you were going to get drafted and you were going to spend time in the military, and you knew that Vietnam was was coming. And so, uh, the, you could either enlist, try to choose your your branch of service, or just wait until you got drafted. My brother waited till he got drafted. I went out and joined the Marine Corps. Uh, Mike had already been in the Navy, but anyway, you 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 that was what you faced. And in in uh, uh, Oliver Stone's situation, just like uh, the person uh, that sort of portrays his uh, him in the movie uh, named Taylor, played by Charlie Sheen, um, he enlisted, dropped out of school, enlisted, and wanted to go to Vietnam for the experience. And this is the experience he got. Uh, now, uh, the, as I mentioned, the tour of duty is a year. So with the, with the way they would refer to it is 365 and a, and a wake up. And then you could go home. Or if you were wounded twice or, or otherwise incapacitated, then, then, you, then they would take you out of combat. Otherwise, you're, you were there. And uh, the, they, unlike in World War II, if you went into a unit, you stayed until the end of the war. But in Vietnam, they would they would rotate people in and out, so there are always new people coming and going. And one of the problems with that is that by the time that a unit became seasoned and built up its expertise and its reliance on on, on its individual members, people would be rotated out. So they would lose that sort of competence level that they would develop. And that was one of the criticisms of this of this way of run, operating the the war. So. Um, this is this this is what the basic movie goes through several patrols in the jungle. It was filmed in the Philippines, in the jungle, which is just like Southeast Asia. And one of the things that uh, that um, Stone uh, decided to do is he brought on a, a retired Marine Corps captain named Dale Dye as the military advisor. And uh, Dai uh, recommended that they bring bring aboard a couple of drill instructors, and they put the young actors who were to be to play the different parts through two weeks of intense combat-oriented boot camp. And they did that, and they took them out in the jungle, and they gave them weapons training, made them learn how to you know take apart the weapons and operate them, and sleep in the jungle, and eat military food, and 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 uh, mainly he said he wanted them to be so tired that they could barely think and then have to to go through a simulated combat, which he, he did for them. And they all said uh, in other interviews that this was very valuable because it created a sense of cohesion amongst these young actors. And they were all young, and, and uh, Stone made an effort only to get young people and not some well-established star to play, to play in the various roles. Now, You'll see from the the list of the, the actors involved that they all went on to have uh, really good careers. Johnny Depp was in here, Forrest Whitaker, Tom Berenger, and uh, uh, Willem Dafoe uh, all went on and had uh, great careers. But anyway, this developed a sense of cohesion, which I think comes out in, in the movie. And one of the side things I'll just mention is that after they, a day shooting, they had a, a club that they would go to where they'd hear music and they'd drink and, and carouse. But as characters were killed off in the movie, Stone would send them home immediately. And so, and so it was almost realistic in the sense that they had this comradeship uh, going on and then people would begin to disappear just as if it was real, you know, they'd been killed and they were no longer and so they, they, there were a couple of the actors that remarked upon that sense that uh, they had that sense of realism. In any case, the the basic story is these series of patrols and battles and ambushes, and um, and there's and the conflict between the platoon sergeant, remember the lieutenant, and then you have the platoon sergeant. That's played by 
Tom, Tom Berenger, amazing job, and he's Staff Sergeant Barnes, and his he he is in conflict with uh, Sergeant Elias, uh, played by uh, uh, Willem Dafoe. Charlie Sheen is the new guy who comes in to do his tour of duty. That's that's Private Taylor, and the. The basic story is kind of narrated through Taylor, who is, I guess, uh, uh, Oliver Stone, and uh, he he uh, writes letters to his grandmother and kind of narrates his way through it. And his his the change in his uh, attitude and you know based on his experiences and his thinking about good and evil, and uh, and the conflict between Berenger. And uh, Willem Dafoe also raises those very interesting issues about good and evil. I'll have something to say about that later, because I, I thought that was very interesting. Anyway, um, I think that that gives you the... I'm not going to go into the various battles, because we can do that as we go along. Uh, but it's very graphic, very realistic, and uh, I think raises all the issues that, of, of the Vietnam War that you know we've been pondering ever since then. Oh wow! Okay, I'll tell you that if uh, if this uh, movie um, had been made during the Vietnam conflict, um, people would have all run to Canada. Uh, I think so. It, it was not pleasant. Um, <laughs> Mike, uh, you you have many thoughts about this, I'm sure. This is not entertainment. It's it's a disturbing movie. It's uh, it, it's terrible. It shows the worst. It's the most realistic war movie I've ever seen. This is They don't gloss things over in this movie. And what they don't tell you in the movie, what was going on at home, um, the Vietnam War was still popular among the public, but it was waning. And it was uh, there were a lot of protests, and all of my classmates were against the war. But unlike my classmates, uh, but like uh, Oliver Stone and his character, uh, Charlie Sheen, they were both college students. And they, like me, volunteered to go to Vietnam. Uh, they believed in the war. Uh, they wanted to fight the communists. Um, that's where the action was. That's, uh, for me, uh, that's what the Navy's business was. So my my choice was to go do what the Navy does. So I volunteered uh, to go to Vietnam, just, just like these folks. Um, but it's the very first scene in the movie is sort of a pre of the a summary of the whole movie. You see this uh, plane come down and out comes a bunch of uh, soldiers. They're all got haircuts, they're young, they're good looking, they're clean cut, they've got good uniforms. Char Charlie Sheen is among them. But when he gets out of the onto the tarmac, probably Tonsonude Airport off of out of Saigon, where I've been, uh, they see body bags. And a good friend of mine was a Vietnam soldier, a war soldier, and his job was, as he told me, was to tag and bag the bodies. What a terrible job. So the first thing Charlie seen, sees uh, you know, these bodies, body bags, and then he sees soldiers that are going home. And they look older, they look bedraggled, their uniforms are not the greatest, their hair, their hair has grown out, and they look at each other sort of mystified. And the, the soldiers going home are looking at these soldiers coming and they were them a year ago, and now Charlie Sheen is sort of looking at his uh, character in a year from now as, as he becomes one of those. Uh, Stone was disillusioned with the war. Um, he, he thought we shouldn't be fighting communists there. And, and he said that, uh, that he lost his youth in Vietnam, and he wanted mothers to be the major people to see this movie because the mothers would help keep their future sons from going to war, would stop future wars. Uh, I saw it a little different in my perspective. Uh, of course, I wasn't in foxholes. I was on a ship. Uh, 
But I have to tell you, when I went to Vietnam, I had never seen a dead body before. And I saw many. Uh, I had never killed anybody. Uh, and I personally did with my five inch 54 guns that I controlled that I'm not proud of. But just like Stone's figures in this movie, they're fighting to, to protect their own buddies. Uh, when I killed VC, they were killing my fellow soldiers and Marines. So I was protecting them and that's how they feel. So we feel justified in doing it. But I don't, I don't feel like I left my youth there, but I've, I went there as a college graduate, and after two tour, tour, tours of duty, I returned as a combat veteran. I grew up. I, I became a man there. So in a sense, I, I, there's a positive side to my experience. Now, Stone made an anti-war movie, but he, th he said it was more of an anti-authority movie. And I think... Among Vietnam vets, there's a lot of uh, that resonates uh, because we were hamstrung during the war with rules of engagement uh, that uh, pre prevented us from going all out to win the war. Uh, Admiral John Hyland, who was commander in chief of the Pacific Fleet at the time, uh, he was interviewed, and it's in the latest issue of Naval History magazine. And he said, if we'd been turned loose, we'd have won the war. And I think most of my Vietnam vets felt we were being held back. And so uh, we could have won the war. Uh, I want to share one quote that I, I sort of, I think, encapsulates this movie and the gristle that these, not just the actors, but the people they're portraying felt in the war. So the sergeant says to Bob, I got a bad feeling on this one. All right. I mean, I got a bad feeling. I don't think I'm going to make it out of here. You understand what I'm saying? And Bob says, everybody's got to die sometime. I, I had a sort of a similar experience. I'm on the bridge of my ship and we've been shooting uh, VC ashore, and another officer, Mike Moss, and I were sitting on, standing on the wing of the bridge, and we're looking out over Vietnam really close. It's a hill, it's hillside, and we're up close against the, co the coast. Water is, is like a glass, and we see bullets tracing down toward us. They just stitch. We were being shot at by a machine gun. I mean, he and I. And I said, Mike, I think we're just being shot at. And he said, Mike, don't worry about it. In your case, don't worry about it, because I'm told that only the good die young. Oh. <laughs> Let me ask you a question, Mike. If, if I, I totally agree that the war was completely mismanaged, and I, don't, I still don't understand why until today, except that they were just didn't know what they were doing. I, I, I often thought that McNamara should have gone to prison, I'll just say that, for how much, what he did. But anyway, let's assume that, that uh, we had, it would have been managed well and we had won. Do you think the South Vietnam would be a prospering democracy today? It's hard to, it's, it's hard to tell. Um, it, it certainly wasn't then. It, yeah, maybe it, if we stayed there and had bases like we did in Japan and Germany. Yeah, it it uh, it was always a trouble troubling. Uh, South Vietnam was very troubling because it it was one dictator after another. Well, so, and it, ra it raises this issue of what we do overseas, right? You know, we, we go. It seems to me that only where we've completely destroyed the place and we keep our we keep troops there, like Germany, South Korea, um, Japan, uh, th those those. But those countries can change. Those cultures can change. Going into Viet places like Vietnam and not winning uh, or overwhelming and going into Afghanistan and going into Iraq, uh, it doesn't work. And um, uh, maybe we're learning that for a generation or so until, you know, people think that they can, can succeed with those things again. But I'm digressing a little bit. But that's well, one of the things that really, re really brought back to me when I was going through this 
But we did a great job in Japan. Uh, we transformed that country to yeah, a democracy. Well, this brings us this brings us to Barnes and Elias. See, uh, the way I look at Barnes, you know, here's this battle scar. He's got these scars on his face. He's been shot seven times. He's very harsh with people. Tells them what to do, and as you say, tells them you want to live forever. Just get out there and do your job. He's there. He believes in the mission, mission first, right? Uh, and he's going to get it done. And he's going to he's going to do what it takes to get it done. Rules of engagement, international law, all that stuff, be damned. Whereas Elias is is on the other side here. He's he's also a seasoned professional, but he's beginning to have his doubts about whether this was a good idea or not. Though he's still he's still intent on doing his duty in the way he sees it. But he's got a mu- he's got a much more humane um, a personality, and that seems to develop more and more. And then Taylor, of course graduates to him, but it raises this issue uh, of when you go to war, uh, you know, we all know from history that wars just get more and more savage as they go on. And 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 the, there's more and more effort put into it, simply winning the thing and getting it over. And that's what happened in World War II and, and I guess in Korea. Uh, and that these, the, the conflict between these two characters in the movie raise that for me well you know it wasn't only between the two characters they divided the platoon that's right yes some of the platoon were on one side and the others were on the other side and so as a fighting machine they were not too effective uh when they were divided that way sorry mike well no that's right i uh you saw how the combat and the the killing of their fellow soldiers, uh, in one case, the guy was tortured, mm-hmm. he dehumanizes these young soldiers, and some of them lost their way. They, they, Charlie Sheen lost his, the, the character lost his way, and he wound up killing a Vietnam, uh, Vietnamese unnecessarily. And th- there was in this movie a mini Mi Lai. Mi Lai was the, the village that was massacred by. Uh, by Lieutenant Massey and his name Kelly, Kelly and his uh, platoon. Uh, mm-hmm. So there are some parallels with this, but you saw the character just devolve. Um, Barnes became just totally evil. Mm-hmm. He, he kills Elias, or he tries to. I guess he he shoots him, uh, okay. and then he's he's left to the to the Vietnamese. Uh, but we had a lot of lessons learned. In this movie, it it took a long time for America to heal its wounds from this war, and the Vietnam Vietnam Memorial was was helpful in in many ways for that. Plus, there's a traveling wall that heals. That's a mini Vietnam War Memorial that uh, that that helped the country heal from those all of the schism, and I mean heals the people who are anti-war. It heals the people. Families that lost loved ones, it heals the Vietnam vets like myself that came back. Um, we, none of these folks going there are trained to cope with death, uh, dismemberment, the worst that they undertook going out on those patrols. None of us are, are prepared for that. There's there's no training to, uh, and, and there were no helpful places to, to go back and talk talk about it. When, when I when I shot a five inch fifty four gun through the director, where I was I was directing it directly onto a Viet Cong bunker. No nobody nobody was there to to ask me if that was okay. Did you? I mean, were you even able to experience it? You you just had to buck up and do your job. Uh, so that's why I think a lot of people came back with PTSD. But one of the greatest lessons of this war. Um, and they, and it resonates with this book, movie was the Weinberg Doctrine that was articulated in the 80s uh, as a lesson for future wars. And I don't think we're um, following it. Uh, and so we think we've learned the lesson, but I don't think we always do. And the Weinberg Doctrine says you only use force if it's vital for a U.S. or allied interest that 
you do it. And when you use it, you use it wholeheartedly, which is what we did not do. We had our hands tied behind our back throughout the war in Vietnam. But, uh, and that's what Admiral Highlands was saying in, the, in his article, that we got to commit 100% and then only do it if you've got strong political and public support uh, and that, the, that the, our directives, our, our objectives are clear and that we continually readjust those objectives uh, and adjust them, the force factor based on that adjustment, and then commit only if there's a reasonable insurance that Congress and the public is going to support your effort, and then finally only as a last resort. But uh, I have I my doubt that we're following those. I would add, keep it right. short. Keep, I, I would add, and keep it short. I keep it short. I agree. Well, Schwarzkopf did it. Yeah, Desert Storm was a good example. Yeah, that was a prime example of the Weinberg Doctrine in play. But I, I don't, I don't, I, it didn't happen in Afghanistan. It didn't happen um, uh, in uh, in Iraq. Uh, and I worry about us not following those uh, as we get enmeshed in the Middle East. Is that because of the drift that the politicians seems to seem to get involved in, and, or is it the failure of the military leadership to uh, clearly set out for the our, our um, you know civilian leadership what they're I, doing? On uh, a good question. Well, it starts well, out. Yeah. It starts out about making getting into a war in the first place. I mean, there's still a contention about the Gulf of Tonkin and uh, the Turner Joy and whether that was really an attack on, on U.S. interests or just a provocation. Um, and then, of course, you have the, the war machine in Washington, um, you know, putting 50,000 young men and some women into harm's way. And those guys along the Cambodian border in platoon, did they know what they were doing? Could they relate? To some higher purpose? Did they understand uh, what this was about, why they were risking their lives? I don't think that, you know, if you watch the movie, you really wonder about that. Did, what were they doing there? Did they have the answer to that question? Um, then, of course, you have the atrocities. Uh, so, Mike, you say it's good to win and you have to throw everything at it, but, you know, there's a, I, there must be a word, maybe in German. Uh, that describes a killing lust. Um, and that's what they were doing in that village. It was My Lai in the movie. It was it was really, uh, and, and you wonder if there was My Lai on one side with Lieutenant Kelly, and then the experience that uh, Sheen had and Oliver Stone had in this village in, in the movie, you wonder how many places were experiencing the same kind of killing lust. Is that winning? Um, to kill innocent men, women, and children. Uh, uh, it, was, it was really shocking, the level of atrocity that he portrayed. And um, I think that's one of the takeaways of the movie, isn't it? Well, it, ha it happened, and, you know, we have to win the hearts and minds of the people that were there to, to serve. Uh, and so much of those atrocities happened out in the field that, that just turned them off. It's really sad. Can you go into another country like that and win hearts and minds? Can you? Uh, you really have to know the culture. You have to be able to talk to them like human beings, and that's not easy. We haven't really perfected that. Uh, and, and I think we got burned, don't you? I mean, we got burned in Vietnam. We lost Vietnam. I was in Vietnam a year ago, and um, mm -hmm. they're kind of still celebrating the fact that they won and we lost. But I think we're still celebrating the fact that we lost. And when you when you see politically um, that um, you know both sides of the house want to avoid putting boots on the ground, when they say that and they make that policy now today, they're thinking about what happened in Vietnam. It, it was it was our loss. It was our Donnybrook, uh, and yeah. it, it defined American. And what do you want to call it? Warfare policy from then till now. What, one of the things I, I thought was really interesting about, you know, the last great battle in, in the movie 
uh, where the where the NVA North Vietnamese Army overruns the uh, command post and and uh, and they have to slug it out um, um, man to man uh, with the enemy. Uh, the the way that they portray the chaos and the savagery uh, that goes on in those kinds of circumstances, I thought was really, I mean, it's very very graphic. Um, uh, but I thought it was a really good thing that that's in a movie someplace so that people can actually see that as uh, as the best possible realistic representation of what actually what it, what it actually means to go into a battle. And um, I, I and what, what I get from both of you guys is that this is an accurate statement of what it was like to be out there fighting in the jungle, you know? And um, we, we heard stories about the men shooting the officers, right? Or fragging them, that, that, that term came up in the movie. Um, Which means throwing a grenade at the officer and killing him. Yeah, yeah. we've heard those stories. And, and uh, you know, if we wondered whether it was a legitimate concern uh, to, to draft dodge, as it were, um, it probably was because the stories were true, um, and, and I, from this discussion and from my own, you know, uh, observation of the movie, I think it's an accurate statement of what it was like, you know, to be out there in the jungle, um, in a mission that you didn't fully understand, with people who were, you know, violent and capable of atrocities, with uh, Vietnamese who would kill you as so much as look at you. Um, and what are, that's hell. That's the seventh circle. And you yeah. can't get out. You have to stay for your year. Uh, and there, I think it was one, did you see this one? There was one guy who wounded himself. Yeah, right. He stabbed yeah, himself. That did happen. The, the, other, yeah. the other thing that's interesting is the, is the way they portrayed the lieutenant platoon commander. The, uh, what a weak personality he was and how uh, and how that played off against uh, the platoon sergeant Barnes, who was the you know the guy who really knew how to fight, and, and I thought that was really good because you know the way it actually works is these young lieutenants who are recent college graduates they go off to their advanced infantry training and their in their basic school and Marine Corps and then they're put out into the field and in, in in control of a platoon and in those days I mean they went right to Vietnam and they were. They were in charge of the platoon, but the people who really had experience were these sergeants. And so I never had to do that personally, but um, I can imagine that, that that is a very challenging uh, uh, job because you have to, you'd have to have those personalities in sync and, to be effective and to uh, you know, not cause unnecessary problems. Uh, you have any thoughts on that, Mike? Well, I, you know, yeah, the, the, I have a feeling that there were a lot of uh, lieutenants like that, young lieutenant, and uh, and they had a high death rate. Down yes. The, but following on in your the last that last major battle, uh, if you remember, they had artillery that they were calling in, and they were dropping down artillery rounds really close to the troops and. And were threatening. There may have been some friendly fire deaths, which happened. Uh, and I had several experiences with a very similar thing. Where, uh, and this was the best of my of my time in Vietnam was when we would get called up by a platoon of Marines or soldiers. Uh, they'd be trapped on a hill, and they were surrounded by Viet Cong, and we would come in with our five inch 54 rounds. We could shoot 40 rounds a, mi a minute uh, up to 10 miles and they're 75 pound rounds and they're pretty powerful. And these Marines and soldiers would spot our rounds only feet away from them. And that was against regulations. We had to, we had to have wider range uh, away from them, but, but they asked, they said, don't, don't worry about getting too close because the v, the VC were right up against them and ready to overrun them. I mean, wipe them out, kill them, every last one of them. And with our artillery being spotted by them 
dropping those rounds all around the hill, we broke the back of the VC, and you could not imagine the happiness that came over the radio with these guys hooping and hollering and thanking us, and I mean, just crying and laughing at the same time. So that was the best of my experience in Vietnam. But it was very similar to what these guys were experiencing. They were they were being overrun. Yeah, the, you know, I saw an interview with Oliver Stone about the, about the, his experience, and he said that, in his opinion, fifteen to twenty percent of the casualties in Vietnam were friendly fire, mm-hmm. and he's reason for that, and as well portrayed in that final battle, is the is the sheer chaos and insanity of what goes on in, in an ambush or a battle. Uh, and the, it, it's unpredictable nature. You don't know who you're shooting at, who's shooting at you, where to shoot, how to shoot. Um, and uh, that's that's pretty uh, uh, interesting. Well, you, well you it's, know, no, it's no wonder that we effectively lost that war. Uh, what, what I what I also noticed uh, when you compare it with wars today or Afghanistan, which is not a great success story, but the technology was really primitive. American technology, um, you know, they had those guns, but they weren't that that accurate, and there was friendly fire problems. And the same thing with the with the with the fighter planes, with the bombs, and the helicopters. Um, so uh, you know, you you like to think that the U.S. is way ahead. Of these mountain people, these people, these North Vietnamese, but I didn't see that in the movie. They were slugging it through the forest, the jungle, uh, without the benefit of a whole lot of technology. Well, except unlike the the VC in North Vietnam, our um, soldiers, uh, we had uh, air cover, uh, mm-hmm. we had lots of tanks, so we did have a, an artillery. We had a fair amount of. We had better equipment and more modern equipment that they had. But I, I see the parallels, the Vietnam War to our own revolution. Uh, we, we beat the, the British, which were the, the finest army and navy in the world at the time. And these ragtag um, patriots in America beat them. Uh, and, and it's because we were fighting on our land and their morale was not great. Uh, and it's, it's it's what you're seeing in a, in Ukraine. Why Ukraine's been able to stand up to Russia so well? You, everybody predicted, even I predicted, they weren't going to last days when the war started two years ago. But they're fighting on their, and so they they're fighting for their own homeland. And and uh, the the Vietnamese, North Vietnamese, were fighting for their homeland. And we're in their property. We're in their backyard. Uh, we're fighting against people who are committed and. And Westmoreland had us reporting these body counts, and that was one of my uh, little jobs. There's a word for it, it starts with S. Uh, S little jobs uh, was to, every day I had to report the body counts to uh, the powers that be. And it uh, and, and didn't matter how many you killed. There but was, did you, well, well, what, did was the, you, what was the point of all that? Was it territory? Uh, well, it sounds to me like we, the, 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 the mission was to destroy as many North Vietnamese as possible. And when you destroyed them all, then you can say you won. Is that what exactly. it was? Exactly. And you couldn't kill enough of them because for every one you killed, there were 10 more. What did you and your colleagues uh, or contemporaries think about that as you were making those counts? What, what was your... I. I, I saw there's a political thing that we were to report body counts. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, for example, there, there were uh, words that we had to use that were just stupid. For example, I had to report that how many logistic pack animals uh, that we killed. Now, logistic pack animal is simply a water buffalo. And the, and the, the, the theory was a VC use, and they did. They used water buffaloes to transport equipment and food and stuff like that. So it wasn't just a water buffalo. It was a logistic pack animal. Mm-hmm. Uh, we interdicted so many lines of VC trails. Who gives a hoot? What, what purpose does interdicting a trail do? You're, you got a trail with nobody there, and we're interdicting it? That, that, we've done something important? That's that's ridiculous. 
Well, it sounds like this was data uh, that Westmoreland wanted to have to uh, defend the war, um, well, to create propaganda back home, no? Yes, it was that. Plus, it was the Wiz kids. It was Robert McNamara in Washington that was pulling a lot of the strings. So everything we were doing in Vietnam was being controlled like we were puppets by the puppeteers in Washington, D.C., uh, the Wiz kids. And those of us that grew up, and I went to Vietnam remembering Robert McNamara being the rah-rah coach in the back, saying how important this was to stop communism. And then 40 years later, in his memoirs, he does a mea culpa, and he never believed it when he was telling us that. That, that offended me almost more than anything about the war was McNamara lied, lied to the soldiers and sailors and Marines that went to Vietnam. He lied to them and the family. And I, I, I'm, uh, I'm offended today by that fact. Tell me the truth. I, I'm there. I mean, I was committed and I, I still, you know, there are those that say that we did stop communism, that domino theory worked. And communism stopped with Vietnam. Uh, Laos fell, but basically communism came to a stop. So there's there's some argument that that there were that, that it wasn't complete. It was not a complete loss. But tell us the truth. Don't lie to us. Well, Chinese communism is spreading all over Asia. Uh, the the yeah. other the other story I heard, uh, and I I it's on. There's a, a good lecture on YouTube about this. It's called McNamara's Idiots, and it's and it's presented by a very credible former military uh, person about uh, how McNamara uh, deliberately uh, caused the induction of uh, th uh, hundreds or if not thousands of uh, draftees who did not meet the IQ cutoff, and uh, they, they referred to as McNamara's Idiots, and they of course. Uh, couldn't qualify for anything uh, complicated, and they ended up in the infantry, and they couldn't, you know, of course, couldn't function in that. I mean, being an effective infantry soldier requires you to be, ha have your wits about you and to be thinking and 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 deciding and moving, and uh, they couldn't do that, so they had a very high casualty rate, and that I believe that's true. And I saw the lecture on it's on YouTube for anybody who's interested in looking at it, but it's. It, that's why I I have a very low opinion as well of McNamara. Well, we, we're almost out of time, you guys. I, let me say that I am blown away by your personal experiences and your reflections over the war and what was happening. It goes way beyond the movie. You are so well qualified to talk about this movie. But let me let me ask you. I'll start with you, Mike, uh, for closing comment. Um, what did we learn from this movie? What did we learn about the war from this movie? Uh, what did we learn about um, the way it affected the United States uh, and how the United States would do wars in the future? I mean, going forward from uh, the way this was uh, published essentially in 1986. Well, as much as possible, we need to stay out of these foreign intrigues, the foreign wars. Uh, and, and, and certainly, if if we're not going to follow the doctrine of Weinberg, uh, it's a prescription for failure wherever we go. And so the number one thing to me is you have to have the, the public totally behind whatever the mission is, and the mission must be clearly defined, and you must know what's the ultimate objective. So what's the end game? I always say that as a lawyer. Uh, when I was reviewing contracts with clients, the first thing I look at is, how do I get out of the contract? And we are forever getting into wars like Vietnam with no end game. We, we, have, there's, we, we haven't defined what the objective is enough so that we can say, this is the end game. The, the, best, the best that ever happened was Desert Storm. And and uh, Schwarzkopf followed the Weinberg doctrine. In fact, not just Schwarzkopf, but President Bush at the time followed the Weinberg doctrine, and he defaulted everything onto Schwarzkopf. And when Schwarzkopf is won, uh, President Bush pulled out. Now that's 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 the way to to run wars. Give it all, 
and then once you're done, you get out. We're, Seems we're not- fundamental that this kind of strategy uh, should, you know, run right through the Department of Defense, uh, which spends uh, something north of nine hundred billion dollars a year on maintaining the um, the finest uh, military force in the world. But you can have a military force that's misdirected, and it's largely a waste. And that, um, Shackley, your your final thoughts on what we can learn here? Uh, just like Mike said, um, I, I'm I'm wondering what our leaders think our goal is in Ukraine. Be interesting to hear them articulate it sometime. Uh, the movie, though, for me, uh, raises these, and I, I highly recommend it for this reason: is it raises this issue of how we as human beings have this capacity, incredible capacity for evil as well as incredible capacity for good. And uh, Sergeant, Sergeant Barnes and Sergeant Elias demonst- beautifully uh, uh, display that and show the conflicts and the, and the uh, dynamics of, of, of those issues in the human, human character. And, 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 uh, and in the end, Taylor, as he's leaving on the helicopter, contemplates and thinks about that and and concludes that he has a duty since he experienced the depths of both of those in Vietnam. He has a duty to make an effort to live a good life, as he puts it. Uh, and But for me, it, it brings you back to this business of how uh, human beings can devolve to absolute savagery when when they think it's in the, in in their interest for one reason or another, whether it's a win the war or stop the bad people or or uh, promote our interests, whatever it is, uh, and then on the other hand, we we have all of our rules of engagement and our international law and our United Nations, and we pontificate to each other, uh, and at the same time allow all the savagery to go on. And that's just part of the human spirit, and I think that this movie raises it in a in the about the best possible way I've seen it done. So I highly. But it's hard as as hard as it is to watch this. It's hard to watch this movie. Yes. You know, like you have to stand up in the middle, make it, you know, to talk, walk around a little bit just to cool off in this movie. Um, and there's a lot of detail in this movie that you don't catch. And uh, I suggest if anybody hasn't seen it, they should see it. Plan to see it more than once, because there's detail in there that is, that is so symbolic and iconic and educational. And I like to point out one thing before we close. And uh, so uh, Sergeant Elias uh, has been shot. Barnes shot him at roughly what thirty feet or so, uh, and it looked like he shot him more than once. That he's fatally wounded, <clears throat> and now he's being chased by the Vietnamese, and uh, he's. He's able to run, quite amazing, um, and they shoot him multiple times, and now he's really dead. But there's this one moment when he dies, where he reaches up to heaven, and his arms go all the way to heaven, and he is essentially talking with his maker. It is a religious, iconic moment in the movie. He is connecting with his God at this moment of his death. There it is. Thank you very much. Um, and, and that's the end of Elias. And it's really the end of the movie. Well, thank you very much, you guys. You're so well qualified to talk about this. And, and it, is a, it is a great contribution to the public conversation. Uh, who may not have seen the movie and who may have very little experience or knowledge about what happened in Vietnam. Thank you, Shackley Raffetto. Thank you, thank Mike Lilly. Aloha. We want to announce that ThinkTech Hawaii is moving into a new phase and will not be producing regular talk shows after April 30th. We will retain our website and YouTube channel and will accept new content on an ad hoc basis.
We are also developing a legacy archive program to provide continuing public access to our content. If you can help us cover the costs of the transition and the development of our legacy archive program, please make a donation on thinktechaway.com. Thanks so much. Aloha.